Good morning, I'm Brian Fernandez, and on BizTech Conversations today, we have with us Norway's ambassador to Malaysia, Gun Jorid Rosé. Welcome to the show, Your Excellency. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Now, Norway is one of the world's richest countries per capita. Now, you've a population of just 5.5 million, but you've got a sovereign wealth fund of over 1 trillion in assets under management. Mm. Now, that works out to be about 200,000 US dollars per capita. Give us an overview of the Norwegian economy and, and what are the key sectors? The key sector, I guess the first thing you think of maybe about Norway is oil and gas. Yep. Uh, it's been, we are part of the same generation as Malaysia, I think when it comes to the history of exploring and finding our resources. So still 20% give or take of our GDP comes from oil and gas uh, revenue. But uh, other things uh, such as uh, seafood of course is one of our mm -hmm. main export uh, articles. So in the future, I hope that you know a lot of green solutions, uh, new inventions will also come out of uh, this green shift that the Norwegian economy is in the midst of currently. So that's interesting because um, you're not the only economy that's undergoing this green shift. China is one of them. But mm. walk us through maybe the green shift in Norway. When did that start happening? I think it's been an ongoing process for many years. But uh, I think in the last two to three years, you've really seen a strong push uh, both from the business itself, but also from government. We see that a lot of the expertise that has you know, been developed through many years of working in the oil and gas sectors. These people are now uh, heading companies working on renewable energy, taking their experience in putting up large energy projects into that new sector. We see that the government has uh, just last week actually launched a big, uh, big project, uh, which we call the long ship, you know, mm -hmm. the Vikings travel yes. the world and on their long, uh, long ships on carbon uh, capture storage to sort of, uh, because we've said that uh, we will reduce our CO2 emission with 50 to 55 percent by 20. 30 and then we have to act. Wow, that's so, very aggressive. You know, then the, the government pushes also to say that, you know, we have to use the high tech expertise, the know how, and the possibility to invest in such a huge project with approximately 12 million billion uh, Malaysian ringgit to actually show that we mean what we are saying. So this is a new engine of growth. So traditionally, one of the things Norway has been very strong with is in technology, in particularly in telecommunications technology. Mm. So you look at, I think more, uh, Malaysians are familiar with DG, of course, uh, Digi is actually owned by Telenor. Mm. Uh, uh, walk us through that journey in terms of the digital economy. So obviously renewable energy is something that you are now a key sector of growth. Mm. But uh, traditionally it's been telecommunications and therefore mm. you're native to digital economy. What sort of digital economy stuff are you all looking at? No, I think it's the whole specter of uh, public sector putting their services out so that uh, our taxes, our salaries, uh, Everything is done now on a digital and I don't get a, a payslip anymore. I don't put in my text on a report on a sheet of paper. This is all done digitally. And then it's really a partnership between the government and key private actors like the bank, like the telecom companies who can provide the solutions, uh, who can provide the security so that our data are uh, protected but then also can simplify the lives of uh, us as citizens and also create then jobs because there are large things at stake here. Just, as I said, these are private and vital information about people, so we have to feel that they are safe. So then, you know, everybody chips in to make sure that we as end users feel comfortable about this change, but then there's also business opportunities then for, for others uh, in this. Yeah. Okay, and th let's move on to the oil fund. I think yes. it's a particular interest <laughs> that you know everyone talks about around the world. Now, can you walk us through the history of the oil fund mm. and what its mandate is? Well, I think the mandate, if you simplify it really, is to make sure that the revenues generated today will also be to the benefit and good of the future generations. I think it's also a, a somehow a green approach to that because if you spend it all now, uh, I think the temptation will be also maybe to search for the short-term solutions. But I think when it when the ID emerged in, in the early 90s, uh, I think the first money coming into the fund came around 1996. I think it was the backdrop of, you know, the global economy being through some, some quite um, challenging times, also the oil prices. Uh, 
So I think when they first started out, there was a bit of an you know, open approach, see what will, it, will this actually generate. Uh, but I think it was also a fear that uh, you know, if one put too much money into the economy, uh, it wouldn't be you know, too beneficial of the economy. Uh, in the long run, there were fear of you know, this Dutch disease overheating the economy. Yes. So that was the backdrop when they set this fund up. And I think the... The strength of the fund has then been that it's been really, it's not, you know, safeguarded and controlled solemnly by the government, but this is under strict control by the Norwegian parliament. So, and they have set down this rule that you cannot spend more than 3% of the surplus of the fund. But this year you're spending... Directly into the GDP. Yeah. But, but I think this year it's 4%, right? Because of COVID. Because of COVID. And of course, uh, the Norwegian economy, maybe I must say we are humble by the fact that we are managing maybe better than a lot uh, of countries in these uh, very challenging times. But of course, for us also, it's been a hard hit. So then the government has... Uh, gone to parliament and they have been granted uh, a possibility to spend up on up to 4% this year to you know help uh, people who have lost their jobs to put up funds available for small and medium sized enterprises especially who need some support to keep their business running and uh, i think also funds have been specially targeted to companies who are you know just on the breach of maybe launching a new product this new innovation, uh, small companies who are, as I said, just about to make it and maybe they, they not just uh, were stopped from entering into that fo- final stage of uh, bringing their new invention to the market. So I've been, I think it's uh, one of the strengths in our economy as well that even in hard times like we are going through now, uh, the funds that have been put aside as extraordinary means have also been very future oriented and that we try to also protect the innovative part of our economy, making sure that the institutions who support innovation and the uh, development of new technology can assist the small ones who need that, you know, hand to hold. <laughs> I, th- I find that very fascinating because mm. I think that is a, a, v- an, a very good approach and complete contrast to some other larger economies where the 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 pump priming and quantitative easing has gone into financial assets and hard assets to which doesn't benefit you in the future so you are already thinking of the future by investing in your companies who are just in the crust of innovation i th- i find that quite fascinating mm-hmm. now what are the key lessons then in terms of given the success of managing your ass- your your fund so well mm-hmm. and now it's over a trillion us dollars What do you think the lessons that could be drawn from other funds? For example, new funds that have been set up, the Saudi Social Mm. Wealth Fund, for example, Mm. which has about, if I'm not mistaken, 300 billion uh, kind of seed money for them. Mm. But what what do you think the lessons we could draw from? And even Malaysia and and some of the other sovereign wealth funds around the region. I think any country needs to find a model that is suitable for their needs and also, you know, their approach. But and the management of the fund in Norway hasn't been without discussion and debate in parliament or among economics either, you know, should they take more risk, less risk, infrastructure, property and all these things. But I think in hindsight, the one of the big success has been, you know, the long term vision, the broad political consensus that's been built across, you know, the party divisions in Norway that, you know, this is something that I think if you see a change of government, the policy will sort of be kept on. And I think also to then you know, leave it to the experts to actually manage the fund. It's a small group of, uh, of people who sit and do the investments based on the guidelines that come from the parliament or the government approved in parliament. So uh, maybe to avoid uh, then the, the temptation that I think lies with anybody to, to go in and look for the short term solution. So, you know, it's really um, the technical management of the fund is left to the people who are experts in doing so. And one of the things we'd like to thank you for me as a Malaysian, mm. as part of the research, mm. I understand that the, your fund has purchased about two billion US dollars in Malaysian government bonds and also has directly or indirectly invested in mm. about a hundred com- Malaysian companies, mm. either th- as I said, either directly or through indirectly to third party funds. Mm. So. 
I didn't imagine that. I mean, that's, that's quite a big footprint then mm. in Malaysia. No, it speaks well of your companies because, uh, you know, there's strict regulations and rules and also ethical guidelines on which companies that the fund can invest in. And of course, I must, as the ambassador, we are never consulted in any regard, <laughs> but I think it's a quality stamp of the Malaysian uh, companies, of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, speaking about relationships, mm. um, we've had diplomatic relationships uh, a relationship for 52 years. Mm -hmm. um, what, how would you characterize the relationship today? Very good. I think we have uh, a very uh, good and predictable bilateral relationship. It's, of course, always been more uh, focused on our business footprint, the economic relations. Uh, but Norway has put a lot of emphasis on this region over the last decade. We have become a sectorial dialogue partner of ASEAN. There are so many regional platforms where we also meet, and I think that has also strengthened the bilateral relationship with each country in ASEAN. So now we see also more enhanced political dialogue with Malaysia on, on issues of uh, common interest. And, and what are these common interests? Give uh, us an example. For example, uh, as small countries in a you know big and complicated world, <laughs> Uh, I think if you saw the statements of our two prime ministers recently now in the UN General Assembly debate, both uh, said repeatedly that, you know, multilateral cooperation, strong uh, multilateral institutions are vital. So I think both Malaysia and Norway are countries who really champion the role of uh, the UN, the multilateral system. Of course, we can always push for improvement of those institutions as well also a predictable international trading system, the importance of international law, like, you know, the law of the sea, yeah. the, these institutions that also protect the, in the trading world. So I think you can see that we are very like-minded in that approach to a strong multilateral system guiding us. And speaking of trade, our bilateral trade numbers are, hover around something in the region of just over 600 million. Heavily favoured, uh, I think about 50% in Norway's favour. What do we buy from each other? Buy and sell each other, more likely. Well, I, I think these numbers fluctuate a little bit uh, regarding in favour of who also, but it's a lot of the things being part of the sort of uh, total value chain in the oil and gas industry. So parts and pieces linked to the production here and there. Uh, we buy electricity from Malaysia. Malaysia buys Norwegian seafood. For example, now we've seen, of course, uh, in COVID also that uh, Malaysia's role as the leading manufacturer of, of medical gloves, for example. Yes. So, of course, that's uh, that's important. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Now, there's about 50 Norwegian companies operating in Malaysia. Mm. Could you give us some high-level numbers in terms of significant investments by Norwegian companies? Significant. I think in the sectors where we see we are large, of course, you know, DG, uh, shipping, uh, renewable energy is a new sector that has uh, really grown over the last uh, and And who is in, so in renewable energy, who has invested in us? That's a Norwegian company called Scottex Solar, who uh -huh. are now already operating three uh, solar uh, energy plants and selling electricity to the grid in Malaysia and they they are very open to do more here also. Uh, Have yeah. they found it easy because after all um, electricity and mm. pow power generation and transmission is a highly regulated industry. Mm. What have been, have been their challenges in terms of doing business in Malaysia? I think they have found it uh, overall a very positive experience. In fact, they would like to have Malaysia as their hub uh, for their investments in in Southeast Asia. Okay. So I think this is a large company with a long-term perspective and they know that if you want to enter into the energy sector, you have to take the time to negotiate uh, with the, you know, the regulators and, and the national uh, sort of you know owners of the grid, so to say. So I think they, all in all, they have been very, very happy to, to settle down in Malaysia. Okay. Yeah. On, on the flip side, however, there hasn't been a lot of Malaysian direct investment in Norway. Mm. What do you think the case is? Why, why haven't they done so? I, I think that question, of course, is not entirely up to me to answer. But as in any economy, as you know, for us, the largest markets are also our closest neighbours. So maybe Norway seemed to be very far away. But what I can say on the positive side for Norway is, of course, uh, we're not 
members of the European Union, but we are members of the uh, internal market. Uh, the Nordic region is a very open region. I mean, we had a common market long before the European Union yes. even. So, uh, of course, coming to Norway, you don't only get Norway, you get uh, the Nordic region, you get, you get Europe. But of course, the language could be a barrier. Um, it's a high cost, uh, cost country, yes. so that's, that could be an issue. Um, for many, maybe we are seen to have very strict laws on you know, protecting uh, workers, uh, very str strong employers uh, or labor trade unions. Uh, I think once you have learned how it works in Norway, that can also be you know, flipped to something positive, because then it's, very, it's not a very conflict-driven relationship between employee and employers, because this is very regulated. But uh, I think setting up business in Norway, of course, you have to uh, study and learn these models for cooperation. And, and which brings me to an interesting part. I think mm. sometimes people in ASEAN, we don't understand uh, Norway as, as well as we should. And so as part of this uh, research for this the, uh, interview, I read a survey, a 2019 survey done by Kanta mm. on what is important to Norwegians. Mm -hmm. And there were three things top of mind. Hmm. One was climate change and 49% hmm. of respondents uh, listed that as an important hmm. factor. The second was healthcare and the third was immigration and integration. Hmm. Could, could you kind of shed some light into some of these values and issues? Hmm. No, I think climate change, uh, obviously we are, uh, you know, few number of people living in a vast uh, beautiful uh, geographical area uh, with distinct seasons. We see that the seasons are not so distinct anymore. <laughs> uh, we live close okay. to the Arctic area where the ice is melting, melting yeah. the biodiversity uh, and you know using the nature, being close to nature is something very important to Norwegians and also I think part of our political history as well to preserve, to make sure that our fishery resources are there for the future, for example. Um, so this is all interlinked. So I think when you see our international climate uh, involvement also globally, it's because uh, we feel the urgency. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, for uh, to maintain this um, uh, tight-knit society where, where, you know, as, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I wouldn't say, or People might even say that we are a bit conflict shy in the Nordics, but okay. th that we have this model of, uh, you know, respect and and the um, uh, gap between, uh, for example, a child and a parent or a, an employee and a boss isn't really that you know big when it comes to you can That's always right. speak up um, between men and women. It's very gender uh, equal society. Uh, so that we are able to maintain this model. I think it's important for us uh, and thus also this question of uh, immigration, integration, because uh, also Norway we have become more multi, you know, cultural and a plur plural society. Um, and uh, that's, I think, it's a, it's a basic notion in Norway that, you know, people in need uh, are welcome. Also people with talent, uh, you know, who come from all over the world and would like to come and, and, and live in Norway, uh, but the, you know, then again it has to be done in a way so that we can still uh, provide that safety net to the next generation regardless where they are, I mean to all Norwegian regardless where you know their parents originally were born, but uh, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, and I, I want to sort of throw light into that because mm. uh, that particular issue in terms of integration mm. and immigration mm. because obviously you're a very small country, mm. in fact, and, and the Nordic countries in the past mm. have been quite generous in terms of accepting refugees mm. to a point now there is a bit of a pushback because it's perhaps uh, some sectors of your population mm. uh, find it a little bit more uncomfortable. Mm. I mean, could, could you shed some light on that? Has that? Is that becoming more of an issue or is that just uh, something that's sporadic? I think it's an ongoing discussion and it's something that we see in, in a lot of European countries, I guess. But uh, as I said, I think the starting point of the discussion must and should always be, you know, respect and, uh, uh, and to acknowledge the concern of, of people. But I think all in all, uh, you know, for Norway, um, 
immigration has always been very positive. It's been either coming you know, to the labor or as refugees. Most people are very successfully integrated. Uh, so I think it's positive for Norway in our approach to the world since we are such an open and export oriented economy as well. Uh, so, but I think for us, as I said, uh, having this DNA of uh, uh, a belief in a quite equal society and with the possibility to gen generate uh, our income also to then benefit uh, the next generation. So I think that's, that's some of the worry that may arise from time to time that can we afford that in the future uh, as well. Uh, but I think all in all, it's a very positive and healthy debate. Uh, and of course, uh, any other aspects of such a discussion must be, you know, uh, I think, crushed <laughs> at birth, more to say. Mm -hmm. So that's also something that our prime minister and others are very vocal about. Uh, last, just last week, for example, they launched a, uh, a plan on, you know, to stop anti uh, Islam elements, for example, in the society. So uh, I think it's good that we dare to have an open discussion, but it has to be with respect and, and you know, an openness to, to what we would like Norway to be as a society. Yeah. Your Excellency, final question. Um, you've been here for about three years, and I think you've got a little bit more than a year ago. Um, what are your objectives for the next year or so until you leave Malaysia? Uh, in terms of mm. objectives, key objectives, um, yeah. No, I think uh, for this embassy, the number one priority is always to support our companies. That's the main sort of uh, rationale while we are here. Uh, and I think especially in COVID-19, it's very important that whatever we do is uh, with the approach, as I said, to look for the innovation solutions, to look for the future, uh, you know, loopholes or areas of where we can cooperate. Uh, no, so I think it's, you know, in the daily business, it's to work to support our companies, to help them, you know, interpret, understand what's going on in Malaysia, also in, uh, in rules and regulations that are applied that we can sort of uh, bridge that, uh, the, or establish that relationship between the companies and the authorities uh, to make sure that that discussion goes smoothly. And I think on the overall uh, political and global agenda is to, you know, report and facilitate the contact between, you know, our superiors or so to say on the political level between Malaysia and, and Norway so that we all can work together globally to, to combat it, this pandemic, to work to ensure, you know, uh, an international system that can help us all through this uh, crisis and, and, you know, restart uh, all the positive things that uh, we have to continue doing uh, in the new normal, whatever that might be. Yeah. <laughs> Your Excellency, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now, I'm Brian Fernandez and I've been speaking to Her Excellency Gun Jorid Rosse on BizTech Conversations. Check us out at www.biztech.asia for business and technology conversations.